uh, to join for this uh, talk and uh, uh, kindly agree to give a talk for this air quality management lecture series, which we started about almost uh, two and a half years back. Uh, so now uh, uh, it is the 32 uh, monthly lecture. Uh, this has been organized uh, jointly with uh, uh, IIT Madras in association with uh, Air Quality Management Association and uh, Clean en uh, Environment for Planetary Health uh, Asia Network. Uh, again, it is uh, sponsored by GCRF uh, uh, grant. Uh, so I'll just uh, uh, quickly uh, present some of the activities which we are carrying out. So uh, as I told you, uh, see, in order to, uh, we are very keen on addressing this air pollution issues in, in the country. So then we looked at, uh, uh, then there is not, uh, we wanted to start a, a group which focus on air quality management uh, air quality management issues. So with that, uh, I have things in mind. Uh, so we started a air quality management association uh, last year uh, on uh, July 6th. Uh, our uh, director, Professor Kamakoti, and uh, that time chairman of uh, Tamil Nadu Pollution Control Board inaugurated this. And the uh, basic idea is to, uh, you know, reach out to the, you know, school to students, college students, and uh, professionals and regulatory agencies, and also the medical professionals and NGOs uh, to, you know, get bringing them together in a common platform to address this air pollution issues. So, uh, so in order to uh, reach out, uh, because the, the diversity of the different participants, so we started looking into coming out with a newsletter. Uh, uh, it's a name called Prakriti, which is a quarterly newsletter, which uh, invites an, an articles from uh, the students and also the professionals. We also made some small videos to address the environmental issues. Uh, for example, this time we made a, a, a video which uh, talked about how to manage solid waste management. And uh, there are several documentaries we have made and several community activities organizing, uh, you know, drawing competition, postdoc competition, one minute video competition, and also the, uh, you know, uh, 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 competition in terms of quiz. So we, we have made several such, uh, you know, activities in order to reach out to the communities. We also conducted several panel discussion to uh, bring out em eminent speakers to share their ideas to the, the professionals and also the research scholars working in different areas. And we also conducted several workshops with joint workshops with other international organizations. So these are all some uh, pictures uh, uh, which we uh, you know uh, picked up from the earlier uh, air quality management conference. And as I told you, uh, we started organizing this air quality uh, conference. We call it as an Indian International Conference on Air Quality Management, IICOCAM. Basically, it uh, discusses about uh, measurement, modeling, and health risk and uh, public policy aspects. And uh, this year's conference will be the eighth conference. So we started this conference uh, in 2016, and it is very successful. We jointly organizing with several uh, leading uh, technical universities across the globe. Uh, so coming to this air quality management lecture series, as I told you, we started in October 2020. Uh, basically, the idea is to uh, bring this, uh, you know, uh, uh, the young researcher, scientist, and uh, uh, engineers, educators, to in the same platform and uh, to understand what is happening in the latest in this particular field. And also, it will help to collaborating with different experts. So these are all uh, earlier uh, speakers, uh, which they gave a talk in this platform. Yeah, the last talk uh, was uh, given by Crystal. Um, so again, I welcome to you and uh, I request uh, Ms. Gopika to introduce you. Thank you, sir. Uh, greetings of the day to everyone present. It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for the day, Dr. Johan Kualensteiner. Dr. Johan is a research lead at the Stockholm Environment Institute, York Center, Department of Environment and Geography, a member of SIE's Global Research Committee and reader at the University of York, UK, and has worked at SIE since 1989. 
He is a member of the scientific advisory panel of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. His key areas of research uh, relate to the integration of strategies to address climate change and air quality, in particular associated with strategies to reduce short-lived climate pollutants. He has been part of multiple programs and research activities, such as the SLCP strategy support tool, being used by many governments to develop national integrated air pollution and climate change mitigation strategies, the UNEP WMO integrated assessment on black carbon and tropospheric ozone, the CCAC UNEP global methane assessment, benefits and costs of mitigation, mitigating methane emissions, the global methane pledge, the Alliance for Clean Air, and much more. The talk for today is titled Developing Actions on Short-Lived Climate Pollutants with the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and Assessing the Cost of Inaction on Air Pollutants and SLCPs. So we welcome you for the lecture. Kindly share your screen for the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Owen. So welcome you again. So I'll, I'll stop screens. Yeah, please go ahead with sharing from your side. Right. So um Thank you very much for inviting me to to give this talk, and um, uh, I hope it'll it'll tell you something new and uh, based on some of the work we're doing uh, that we've been doing, and and also um, work that is just starting as well. Um, can you see my screen? You can. Yeah, not not it. It is not it shared. Oh, sorry, I had to press that button. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Right. Yes. Okay. Very good. So, um, okay. Um, so what I'm going to discuss here is um, work that we've been doing over the last 10 to 15 years um, in relation to a, what are called short lived climate pollutants. Um, and a lot of that work has been developed with the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, which is a, a coalition of um, state partners. Um, so there are about 70 to 80 countries involved, including India. And a lot of non-state partners. I think we were the first to join. Um, and this is a, a group of people from different countries, from Latin America, Africa, Asia, um, as well as North America, Europe. So it's a, really, a truly global effort. And I'm going to introduce some of the work which is just starting uh, regarding the cost of inaction on air pollutants and, and short lived climate pollutants. So I hope it will be of interest. So I work with the Stockholm Environment Institute. Now, um, although we're based in the University of York, and I've been here since 1986. Um, we've always been part of the Stockholm Environment Institute as well as one of the constituent centres. So SEI is a global research institute which has its headquarters in Stockholm um, and it's trying to address a lot of different environment and development challenges based on the um, conclusions of the Stockholm Conference in 1972 which really emphasize the need to look at development and environment at the same time and that these things cannot be be separated and um, what we try and do is engage with the academic community but also with decision makers and practitioners um, engaging with different policy processes and we also engage with the private sector and so um, what we have is a number of different centers. So we have the headquarters in Stockholm. So we were set up by the Swedish government. Um, the first centers to join were in York and in Boston. The US center now has two offices or three offices in total, but two further ones in Seattle and Davis. The newest center is in Bogota in Latin America. There is a center in Nairobi and another center in Bangkok. Um, there's also one looking at climate adaptation, mainly in Oxford, and we have another centre in Tallinn, mainly working on regional problems and the Baltic and so forth. So what I want to emphasise here is um, the fact that, you know, we're talking mainly about air quality, but when you're looking at the sources of emission, 
most of those sources, especially when you're talking about incomplete combustion, release a lot of different pollutants and greenhouse gases all at the same time. So we're very aware of the nitrogen oxides, the sulfur dioxide, black carbon, um, all contributing to PM 2.5, which is the biggest source of health impacts. But also we have emissions of methane and the NOx and NMVOC emissions and the carbon monoxide emissions contribute to ozone formation. This affects human health, but it also causes crop yield decreases. But at the same time, these emissions are causing climate change, but they're causing climate change in different timescales. So when we're looking at carbon dioxide, once that's been emitted into the atmosphere, it hangs around on average about 100 years. And then this is the main driver of climate change, and it's a, a, a long-term warming. But there are a number of other substances which do affect warming, but which are, have a, a shorter residence time in the atmosphere. That's methane, ozone, black carbon. And these, um, and also hydrofluorocarbons, actually not in here, but, um, it's not a combustion um, source, uh, source uh, combustion is not a source of HFCs. Anyway, these control um, what we might say near-term warming. The advantage of these is that if you, if you reduce the emissions, for example, of methane, methane has an atmospheric lifetime of about 12 years, you will see the benefits within decades. Whereas reducing CO2, it'll take longer to reduce the total CO2 um, concentration in the atmosphere. But the main point is that these, the sources often release all of these gases um, and particles at the same time. So in addressing sources, we inevitably um, have an impact both on climate change and air pollution. And this is the results of a study um, coordinated by the um, Joint Research Center where they looked at the NDCs from 2015 and showed that if you were to implement the NDCs, then it would lead to about half a million fewer premature deaths from air pollution. And if you could achieve two point, a two degree scenario, over a million premature deaths would be avoided. So this really shows that the, the climate action will result in improved um, air quality and reduction in health impacts. So these things are very integrated. So back in, we started this work in 2009 and it was published in 2011. And this was to deliberately look at those substances which were both air pollutants and had an impact on warming. So black carbon and tropospheric ozone are both air pollutants affecting human health and uh, ecosystems and crops, um, but they also warm the atmosphere. So there was a lot of interest in this at the time and we organized a, um, uh, an assessment. It was under the auspices of the United Nations Environment Programme and the World Meteorological Organization. Um, I was the scientific coordinator and Drew Shindell, um, who I still work with closely and who is the chair of the CCAC Scientific Advisory Panel was the, the chair of the assessment. Um, but there were over 150 contributors and 100 reviewers from around the world contributing to this. And there was an innovation here is that we focused on key measures. Um, we focused on methane measures because methane would be one way of reducing tropospheric ozone. It's a very important um, cause of uh, background um, concentrations of tropospheric ozone. And there are a limited number of sources from agriculture, from waste, um, and from fossil fuel industry. These are the main sources of methane. So if we looked at what could be done to reduce these, um, we could look at what the implications are for climate and clean air. The same for black carbon. There are some, there are many sources of black carbon emission. Any incomplete combustion will release um, black carbon. But some of the main sources are cooking with um, with biomass. And so if you replace those with either improved biomass stoves or shifting to LPG, for example, um, reduced burning of agricultural um, residues 
and some industrial um, and then of course transport um, measures to reduce emissions. So in a nutshell, what we found when we started doing this, so the, there was an emission inventory, global emission inventory, um, looking at the baseline and looking at the um, mitigation scenarios for the full implementation of those measures, which we'd found to be the main measures that would give us um, a, a reduction in warming. And what we found that um, if you look at the baseline, you know, we're talking about going up to, this is at the time uh, from 2010, yeah. going up to two and a half degrees, three degrees of warming by the end of the century. If we take CO2 measures, so this was an IEA scenario, then um, it takes a short while. Well, first of all, you can just about see that the the line goes above the baseline, and that's because we're reducing sulfur dioxide concentrations, and you take away some of those cooling aerosols, you get a slight bit of extra warming. But eventually, the warming comes down. But it takes a while because it takes a long time to reduce the total pool of CO2 in the atmosphere, even if we take drastic measures. But what we also then found was that if we looked at these so-called black carbon measures and methane measures, we could make a difference to the temperature in the near term. So by mid-century, we could reduce, if this uh, mitigation was to start around 2010, by 2040, 2050, we could reduce the warming by about half a degree. And if we then looked at what happens if we put all of the CO2 mitigation and the mitigation of black carbon methane together, then we get the best outcome, which has a chance at least of achieving 1.5 degrees C, although this it showed it was going in slightly higher according to these scenarios. But um, certainly um, this then um, showed that by addressing these substances which are fairly short-lived in the atmosphere but are warming, you take away the warming, you get a fairly rapid response in global temperature. So and so um, as Achim Steiner, who was then the head of UNEP, now he's the head of UNDP, said that if somebody proposed that you could save close to two and a half million lives, so this I, I forgot to say that, you know, because we were addressing many of the sources of incomplete combustion, which are uh, one of the main sources of uh, PM 2.5, we reduced the total annual deaths from um, air pollution. And this was just from ambient air pollution. Um, we also looked at the uh, impact of methane and other precursors in the methane in the black carbon measures to reduce ozone, so um, reducing millions of tons of lost crop yield every year. Um, so if someone um, proposed that you could save close to two and a half million lives, cut global crop losses by about 30 million tons a year and curb climate change by about half a degree Celsius, what would you do? Act, of course. So that action was the formation of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. So six nations from Asia, Africa, North America, Europe, and UNEP all started the Climate and Clean Air Coalition in, I think it was January or February 2012. And it's been growing since then. So now, like I said, um, there's more than 70 states, uh, national partners, um, and at least as many non-state partners involved in trying to implement those measures. And we've been looking, so I am sit on the scientific advisory panel, um, and we've been looking into this whole, you know, rationale for a concentration on these sources. So if we look at um, the reference, so this is very similar to what we saw before, and then early action on SLCPs only, um, then how we reach a 1.5 degree C, 2 degree C target by 2100, it matters whether we take the best path, which is addressing both the long-lived greenhouse gases and the short-lived climate pollutants, or as some people are proposing, we only concentrate on CO2 and you get an over potential overshoot of temperature during the century. And uh, there's a difference in cumulative warming. Now, this will affect many impacts, such as 
uh, impacts on the Arctic, impacts on mountain glaciers, that would be very important for the Himalayas, for example. So it matters that we don't just concentrate on one of the causes of climate change, but on all of them. So the Climate and Clean Air Coalition was formed. Um, one of the things it did was to look into more detail in different regions. And so to do assessments involving experts and scientists from different regions. The first one was for Latin America. This one um, was for the whole of Asia. And there are over 100 authors, 50 reviewers, and it looked into particularly the impacts on air pollution. So the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, as it says in the name, is interested in two parts. One is near-term climate change, and the second is the air pollution. So um, this was then focusing, because of the problems of air pollution in Asia, it focused more on air pollution than the global assessment. And what this showed was that if we, so this is the old WHO guideline, now it's at five, um, but if we looked at the 2015 PM 2.5 concentration average population weight to PM 2.5 concentration across the whole of Asia, it's around 43 or so in 2015. This was projected by 2030 to increase to over 60 if some measures hadn't already been taken. So we felt it was important to show that it's not as if people in Asia have not been taking action, they have. So this is where 2030 would have been, but this is where the projections show 2030 is likely to be um, with measures that haven't been taken at that point. So it made a difference, measures that would have been taken, but it's still increasing then to 2030, unless further measures are taken. And then um, there was looking at compliance with recent legislation, would then pull it down to about the same level as 2015. And then um, different scenarios of how far the mitigation measures will be implemented, the ones that were chosen for this assessment, and it could, could take down the um, total PM 2.5 significantly if they were all implemented across the whole of Asia. So this is an optimistic uh, view of what could happen if existing measures, and these are not new measures, but just existing measures and policies were, were adopted across the whole of Asia. So that makes a difference to PM 2.5 concentrations. So this is in the assessment. This is the um, projected 2030 concentrations. Um, and this is, you know, many areas above all of the WHO targets or guideline to, uh, guidelines at the time. Um, and as I said, now it's down at five is the WHO guideline for PM 2.5. And this was then, the benefit of implementing all of those measures. So you can see, I mean, focusing on India, for example, that there is a substantial improvement in PM 2.5 if all of those measures which were used in the assessment were taken. But the other thing that is interesting is um, when some of these measures um, were implemented, there was also a reduction in global temperature from the action in Asia. So this is then you know, shows how if we choose the um, mitigation scenarios carefully, we can achieve both a reduction in air pollution and uh, a reduction in warming at the same time. So this reinforced the message from the global assessment, but was very Asia specific, and it was focusing mainly on air pollution. So you can find that on the Climate and Clean Air Coalition website. Now, the other action uh, activities that SEI, so we were involved in that um, Asian assessment. We've been involved in all of the regional assessments. Um, there's one just, just on the press now covering the Africa region. Um, anyway, we've also been working very closely at the national scale. So as we are, um, we've been aware that there are, there is a lack of capacity in many countries around the world to be able to plan their emission reductions um, and use that as a, a, a way of implementing them. So we've been working on national plans and strategies 
with governments around the world over the last 10 years, um, focusing on countries in Latin America, in Africa, and Asia. And some of these have led to national plans which have been endorsed by national governments, for example, in Bangladesh, in Ghana, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Nigeria, in the Maldives. Um, and some of these, you know, uh, although the focus was on um, short-lived climate pollutants, some of them focused mainly on these short-lived climate pollutants. Um, other ones, like in the Maldives, they didn't have a national air quality plan. So this was the first one that was developed, and we helped them, support them in the development of the analysis and um, the document, which led to their national plan. And these are some of the um, achievements that we've made. So, so Nigeria's National Action Plan was endorsed by the Federal Executive Council. Um, uh, we've worked with Mongolia to show the, um, how the climate commitments can reduce air pollution. We helped develop the first ever clean air plan for Cambodia. Um, we have the SLSP strategy in Bangladesh endorsed by the Ministry of Environment. Um, this first ever air pollution plan in the Maldives. Um, and we've supported quite a few countries in Africa where there is less capacity than say India um, to update their NDCs. So the analysis that we've been doing has been very supportive of countries' NDCs because as I'll show, all of the analysis covers all the greenhouse gases, all the short lived climate pollutants, and all of the air pollutants that lead to PM 2.5 and ozone formation. Um, so, and then a number of countries in, in, in the world, including Chile, Mexico, and Colombia, have set black carbon targets alongside their greenhouse gas tar targets. So, this is putting what might be considered to be a, an air pollution measure within the nationally determined contributions of the country. So um, these are some of the outcomes that we've been helping to develop with our partners in all of these countries, um, either in universities or in the ministries of environment or associated organizations like um, departments of environment or environmental protection agencies. And um, as you can see here, uh, we've been analyzing the nationally determined contributions. And um, the number that highlight the air quality benefits um, in their NDCs has more than doubled over um, the period between 2015 and 2021. And so, and that's both in CCAC partner countries and non partner countries. But so, this link between air pollution and climate change is becoming more prevalent. And um, it's also um, clear from the sort of measures that they've been including in their NDCs that many of these are very effective at reducing air pollution. So air pollution is becoming a bigger and bigger um, feature of the climate plans of countries. So in terms of what we do when we um, help countries to develop their national planning is um, to develop quantitative assessments. So a lot of countries lack the ability to develop quantitative assessments. They lack the ability to develop emission inventories and scenarios to understand the transport of air pollutants and to calculate exposure and impacts and um, also to understand what this means for climate impacts. So we have a tool in SEI, it's been developed for over 30 years, the Low Emissions Alternatives Platform, LEAP. And this LEAP model started life as an energy planning model and is still used by some countries to develop their detailed energy plans. Um, but it also calculates then, so you, you start off looking at the demand for energy uh, and the demand for different um, activities which release pollution. You link it then with um, emission factors and you estimate the emissions of greenhouse gases, um, of um, short-lived climate pollutants, of the main air pollutants giving rise to PM 2.5 and tropospheric ozone. So um, most of what I'm going to talk about is here in the emissions. 
We don't have a formal transport model in um, LEAP, but what we do is we have the results of the GeosChem model where we work collaboratively with the US EPA and um, University of Colorado to give us linear coefficients between emissions and concentrations. Um, and that's how we try and estimate concentrations and impacts. But there's still more work to be done in that part. Um, so LEAP's been used for a lot of climate planning by many countries. Um, and if you want to know more about that, there is a, um, a journal article where we explained how we were developing LEAP um, to assess air quality and climate co-benefits with the application for Bangladesh. So I'll just show you some of the results from that. So first of all, LEAP then gives us emission estimates by sector. So you have to go through all the sectors and put in the data which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, so we then have estimates of the emissions of black carbon from many sectors, um, of methane, PM2.5 particles emitted, which are not black carbon or organic carbon, soft dioxide, nitrogen oxides, ammonia, NMVOCs, carbon monoxide, and CO2 emissions. So we're covering both greenhouse gases, shortly climate pollutants, and um, air pollutants and we can see where they're coming from. Then um, we looked at different mitigation measures. So in the SLCP plan in Bangladesh, they described which measure they were going to look at, whether it's improved brick kilns, improved biomass cook stoves, um, road transport fuel efficiency, wind and solar, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a description of the target. And then this was implemented in LEAP to look at the implications of different emission scenarios. So we have the 2010 emissions, we have the 2030 emissions, which are increasing for CO2, for black carbon, for methane, for NOx, everything increasing. And then we have different, um, we have NDCs, one more um, advanced, and NDC possible, and then an SLCP measure. Um, uh, scenario. So we can see that there is a potential to reduce all of the emissions of greenhouse gases and air pollutants compared to the baseline. We can then look at the, using these coefficients, we can look at the change in ambient PM2.5. We can also see how much of that is due to action in Bangladesh or emissions in Bangladesh, but also from the rest of the world, which I suppose in this case is mainly India. Um, and natural emissions as well. So we can see that action in Bangladesh could substantially reduce ambient PM2.5, and then we can use the PM2.5 concentration estimates to look at the reductions in premature deaths, both from outdoor and indoor exposure to PM2.5. So that's part of LEAP as well. We can look at indoor exposure um, as well. Um, this is another example. This is very recent, so um, the report is about to be launched. Um, this is working with the Pollution Control Department of Thailand. And in this case, we divided the country into um, six different regions, including the Bangkok metropolitan area. Um, and they all have different emission characteristics. And so we collected data for each region and estimated the um, emissions both of greenhouse gases and, for example, PM2.5, but the other uh, pollutants as well. So you can see for PM2.5 that in the northeast area, um, then we have a predominance of agricultural sources, um, burning um, agricultural residues or forest fires um, having the largest impact. But in Bangkok, that's a small amount, but there is more about industry, transport, and waste um, sources. So um, this then can feed in directly feed into you know identifying which policies and actions need to be taken in different parts of the country. Um, but we can also look at the co-benefits of either implementing a climate plan on the PM2.5 or vice versa. So um, the LEAF tool is designed to be a scenario generation tool. So you can put in various drivers and it automatically links all of the sectors to those drivers and you can look at the change in emissions 
in a baseline business as usual scenario. And then in the case of Thailand, we looked at various different national plans, development plans, um, some related to um, the development of electricity, some are related to energy efficiency, um, solid waste plans, transport plans, open burning plans, etc., etc., and then devised from these um, some key, with the pollution control department, some key uh, measures to see what difference it would make. So it makes quite a big difference. So um, in the baseline, it's increasing, but we can decrease it if we undertake mitigation, but then the drivers keep taking over unless more is done, in this case to the industry sector, then you'll still have an increasing PM2.5 emission. And then we can look at the benefits for health from air pollution reduction. So this is then split by age. So we can look at, you know, um, and in this case, one of the things that the Pollution Control Department wanted to do was to look at what happens with delayed implementation. If you wait, you say, okay, yeah, we're going to deal with um, air pollution, but we're going to wait five years. Then that has an implication in the number of people dying during that period. You could have, if you'd have um, developed the or implemented the integrated plan on time, you would save more lives and thousands of lives. So that's, um, again, this is the sort of information that we can develop. Uh, LEAF is a very um, flexible tool, so you can look at lots of different issues and so forth, depending on what you think is important in terms of changing the decision making in your region. In the Maldives, we looked into um, their climate plans and show that this affected PM2.5, but that more could be done if we focused on some of the air pollutant sources in terms of emissions. So um, they're now looking into implementing some of these actions, including emission standards for land and marine vehicles. Um, and in Nepal, we undertook um, some work looking at uh, different reference and policy scenarios um, on the emissions of, again, PM2.5, and again, looking at some specific um, measures in different sectors. So um, we've been trying to put together our knowledge on this um, work um, on the benefits of helping countries to develop their planning. And we found that the existence of quantifying health benefits, for example, of nationally determined contributions, emphasizing the local benefits from climate action can motivate more climate action. So that's something you know, we feel that in many cases, people are more worried about the local air pollution than they are of climate change. But that worry about local air pollution can help to reduce climate change as well and can be reflected in a more ambitious NDC from countries. There are still many countries when they're developing their NDCs who employ the services of consultancies, international consultancies, rather than being able to develop their own plans. So there is a need to develop that sustained capacity in different countries to be able to do this because it has a much better effect on, on um, po national policy making. And especially if we're going to have to update NDCs every year, then uh, we need to build this capacity in different countries. And we tried, there is a document on the CCAC website where we tried to put forward our, in, this is a sort of climate post, focused um, um, uh, guide, which is really trying to say that we can use air pollution as a way of increasing our climate ambition. But of course it can work the other way around as well. So um, we've been trying to develop evidence um, at national scales, at regional scales and global scales to motivate um, action, but we're still trying. So the next um, part of this is to um, look at a scoping study for the cost of inaction on SLCP mitigation. Um, and this is being led uh, from Japan, uh, China, Japan, uh, USA, and we're involved as well. So the cost of inaction, why would we want to do that? Well, partly because economic valuation is um, very, can be very effective at changing decision makers' minds. 
if we can put costs on some of the impacts of air pollution or climate change. So we want to develop costs of inaction to motivate change and increase ambition and provide the evidence base, further evidence to influence decision makers to want to be more ambitious in reducing their emissions. Um, so as part of that, we've got to do what I've just been showing you. We've got to quantify the emissions and understand the key sources. We must be able to quantify the impacts of emissions and look at ways we can reduce those emissions which have benefits but the next step is to quantify the economic value of those benefits. And finally, um, we need to assess the feasibility of achieving that. So we can make some very nice um, scenarios which show that it's possible to reduce um, many of the impacts, but it's also important to see, well, how much is that actually going to happen or what are the actions that are needed to, to promote that? So one of the issues we've got is in defining the cost of inaction. So um, when it deals with air pollution, or in some cases in climate change as well, like the Stern review, then the cost of inaction is the full cost of either climate change or, or um, air pollution. So um, I'll just go into a, an OECD air pollution cost of inaction study. And they said, this is the cost of inaction. It's the cost of all air pollution. But it does seem it's very difficult to get rid of air pollution altogether. So um, we in, uh, are considering that the cost of inaction is actually the difference between taking no action and taking different degrees of action, so scenarios. And the cost of inaction is the difference between those. And then you can compare it to how much it costs to deal with the problem. But we also realise that some costs are very difficult to estimate, even if they're important. This is the OECD study. So they quantified different health outcomes like childhood bronchitis, that in the um, baseline scenario, it would increase from 12 to 36 million uh, in adults from three and a half to 10 million cases between 2010 and 2060, unless something was done. This will, we would also have increased hospital admissions, um, tripling more or less to 2060. There are billions of lost work days and changes in um, GDP in the agricultural sector due to lost agricultural yield. And premature deaths um, using willingness to pay methods, you're talking about large numbers and that would double from 1.4 trillion in 2015 to 3.5 trillion in 2060. They used different types of costs. So you've got, you know, direct costs on health expenditure, you've got lost labor productivity, you've got lost agricultural yield, which can all be turned into dollars or rupees or whatever. Then there are more tricky um, estimates. So for example, when people die, what is the cost of death? And so, you know, this is where the value of statistical life tends to be used, but it's a different type of cost to the direct cost that you calculate here. Um, now, one of the things I've been thinking about in this cost of inaction, so there's, there's quite a lot of interest in cost of inaction. So the CCAC, we're embarking on this new assessment, but also UNEP in Bangkok have been um, looking at cost of inaction in ASEAN region. Um, and it seemed to me that the, as we're saying, the cost of inaction here is the difference between the baseline and the mitigation, but what is included in that cost of inaction? So if we take only air pollution, then we have an impact on health and we have an impact, for example, these are um, wheat plants exposed to ozone in Pakistan, showing um, that the ones which were exposed to ambient ozone in Lahore had a 40% reduction in crop yield. So that's significant as well. So we have these air pollution mediated impacts which have a cost. We also have climate impacts which have a cost. Now, um, generally these have been treated separately just like policy is often treated separately between climate change and air pollution even though they are very related. So in the assessment that we're doing in the CCAC, it would be both climate and air pollution together 
but also if we look at the solutions to um, some of the problems we have so we might for example say well okay so we've got internal combustion engine cars diesel and petrol vehicles they're emitting both greenhouse gases and air pollutants so one measure would be to shift to electric cars which reduce the tailpipe emissions to zero and then it depends on the electricity production method as to how what is the total emission from this shift but certainly at the streetscape uh, level going to electric vehicles will reduce emissions but there are other things we can do so instead of people having a car even an electric car which is clogging up the um, road space we could have everyone going by bus and then you will reduce congestion so this is the same number of people in those cars now traveling by bus and um, you reduce congestion this has an economic benefit to the city but you can also have people walking and cycling um, and then there is an additional benefit because if people walk or cycle they will be healthier this reduces costs on the health service and there's a big economic benefit from people being more active so it seems to me that as well as adding up the benefits in terms or the cost of inaction or the benefits of action of climate change and air pollution we also need to look at some of the other development benefits and try and put an economic value to those if we can so this is a, a summary so we've got air pollution and health premature mortality and morbidity there are methods out there where we can try and estimate these um, and try and estimate the costs um, there are other types of air pollution so there are impacts on tourism if uh, it's very polluted then you know people won't go there that's lost income to those regions um, you get lost productivity because people are ill or they have to stay at home for sick children um, it's difficult to persuade people I mean I've talked to people who in Delhi that they prefer not to live there because of the air pollution so you know cities are competing with each other for talent and so it does make a difference on the economics of a city and the World Bank's done work on that um, and then we've got crop losses and then we've got these climate change there are many climate change impacts all of them with some quite severe economic impacts but then we also have benefits of implementing the measures um, which have an economic benefit and they uh, also are important if we could quantify them so this is a schematic which will be shown next week for the first time um, about what we want to do in terms of modeling to support the cost of inaction assessment so we would like to do this at global scale um, maybe also at regional scale but we need to know what the drivers of economic development are which affects the emissions in the baseline looking at mitigation scenarios and then we want to link to climate models global climate models to atmospheric models look at the change in air pollution concentrations and the air pollution impacts look at global and regional climate change and the climate change impacts and then putting a value on these but also if we can to look at these additional impacts um, from implementing measures um, and putting this up uh, and then also feeding this into these economic models which then because there are spillover effects if um, climate change has an impact on the economy then those will um, those will flow through the economy and they will have what we ideally want although the, the, this model doesn't exist right so we don't have anything which has both air pollution and climate change in the same model at a global scale which then links to an economic model but uh, Tatsuya in Japan can do it with different models so we can start with drivers get emissions impact value and then run an economic model um, and then he can sort of there will be an impact then because this is something that the, the global models don't do they just assume that GDP is not affected by climate change but if climate change or air pollution have a big, big impact on the economy then it must have an impact on GDP which then affects the emissions so this loop is quite important so we would like to be able to run this in many iterations but like I said this doesn't exist yet so we would have to build something um, these are the sorts of SP measures these are very similar to the ones that I've been talking about in terms of incomplete combustion methane 
and also hydrofluorocarbons, which are also short-lived warming agents. And the economic valuation, well, we need to work out how we're going to do this. Um, the fact that we're adding different types of economic valuation and how to deal with that, um, how to link the climate change impact with the air pollution impacts, and then um, using this whole economy model and then feeding that back. And then the sorts of scenarios we're going to use, we're going to have baseline scenarios, maximum feasible reductions, and then likely implementation by specific dates, um, and early and delayed implementation to look at those um, implications. But then we also want to look at barriers to implementation, you know, an assessment of whether and how the measures can be implemented. So we've got some reality in there. And we want to then say, well, if we're going to get these all these benefits, then various stakeholders must do something and then try and be specific about what changes we need. So that's um, a, a, a tour of some of the work we've been doing. Um, there are plenty of other things we could talk about another time, but um, um, that gives an idea of, of what is has been done within um, the work with the Climate and Clean Air Coalition that we've been heavily involved with, um, and also is going to be discussed next week in Bangkok at the annual meeting. So it's a Clean Air Week next week, um, where the cost of inaction, um, the Africa assessment, the uh, work on the private sector, which I haven't discussed, um, is all going to be discussed by hundreds of people. So thank you very much. Well, thank there. you. Yeah, well, thank you very much for a, a wonderful talk and uh, uh, so much insight uh, to the climate uh, uh, pollutants and uh, actions uh, with a vast experience with uh, involving uh, several countries. Um, uh, so before uh, I invite uh, you know participants to type your questions over the chat box so that. Uh, one can uh, answer your questions. Uh, before we start discussing the uh, uh, some question answer session, one all of you just uh, start your camera so that we'll have one uh, uh, photo with uh, Huvan so that, that, that this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we can, we, can you take, uh, take uh, Swaroo? Yeah, that's, can you just start? Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Swaroo, and uh, one, thank you very much. It's a wonderful talk. Uh, I, I think the others, please uh, type your uh, questions on the chat box, and uh, meantime, we'll start uh, discussing. Uh, one, I think, uh, with a vast experience, uh, you know, involving so much, uh, I, I just look at it from from the context of uh, particularly the Asian countries, uh, even in in India, we generally have, uh, you know, when you talk about air quality, we always look at it only particulate matter PM10, PM2.5. That is the only kind of uh, violating, uh, uh, you know, standards. And the rest of the other pollutants in general, uh, in some place, uh, there will can be an issue with the ozone. In some other place, sometimes the NOx or SOx, but in majority of the cases, it is PM 2.5 and PM 10. But when you try to look at it from the context of uh, you know uh, climate actions, I mean th this this will be and you know uh, it is not very ch uh, challenging to quantify. And uh, what's your uh, you know uh, you know because we we focus a lot on this, but its influence on the climate actions is seems to be very less. So. So, um, are you saying that what the link between the climate change and the PM two point five is, or yes? So, um, I think the main point is that most a, a large part of the emissions that lead to PM two point five formation. So, you know, that's from the emissions of nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxides, um, black carbon, organic carbon. A lot of this comes from combustion, either of fossil fuels or biomass. 
So, and, and a lot of those also are release are main sources of um, CO2 as well. So, anything that you do to address PM 2.5 and the sources of PM 2.5, um, not anything, but most things that you do will will um, have an impact on PM 2.5 or and greenhouse gases at the same time, especially if you try and avoid end of pipe solutions. So, you know, if you have a diesel vehicle, you can move to a Euro or Barrett high standard, which reduces the emissions, but it doesn't reduce the emissions of CO2. If you move towards um, public transport with an electric bus, for example, you will reduce both. So there are different, there are choices to be made here. Um, and also, you know, we can design cities better. Um, certainly the cities in India are going to expand a lot in the next decades, you know, and how that's done will look, uh, increase traffic demand and that will also have an influence. So, you know, there are ways of designing cities so that you don't need to travel everywhere to get what you want. Um, and that will reduce both the emissions of greenhouse gases and of PM2.5. So they're just so linked. Um, and if we're clever about it, we can avoid trading off one against the other and we can address both at the same time. Okay, so uh, then in, in your policy aspects uh, and also the, the, the cost quantification aspect, have you looked, uh, you know, uh, uh, relating, because particularly in, in the context of India, we were much more challenged in addressing PM 2.5 and PM 10 pollutants. And uh, mostly when you try to do the source apportionment, we will only, only look at it. Uh, there is a, a key contributor will be resuspended dust. And also yeah. in some cases, it will be a vehicles. And somewhere it is also contributing by secondary uh, aerosols, so our secondary pollutants. So in in that context, uh, you know, how do we, uh, you know, prioritize our actions? Uh, although sometimes if the road uh, resuspension need to be controlled, then I think it's more like a managing the uh, road sector. Uh, so uh, how do you what do you what do you think based well, on your experience with uh, other countries? Well, I think that. Um... In terms of understanding the relationship between emission sources and PM 2.5 concentrations and exposure of people, there are various things that need to be done. Um, so when you look at the source apportionment based on monitoring and the chemical speciation of particles and so forth, I think that that is best used in combination with an atmospheric model because the atmospheric model will give you a much clearer relationship between the emission source, where it is, and the relation to the concentration that people are being exposed to. So the sorts of research that have been done, I know in Delhi they did some research which showed that 50% of the PM 2.5, of all sources of PM 2.5, came from outside of Delhi. And that, that's very common, the same in Beijing. You know, half of the um, sources of PM 2.5 come from outside the city. So um, it's not always obvious, you know, even if you were to be able to speciate the particles and you can say, well, this much comes from transport, you don't necessarily know where that transport is or, you know, the major sources. So you need an emission inventory, you need atmospheric models, and you can you need monitoring. And But to use them together, I think, is much more effective than you know sort of just using one or the other so it's it's an iterative procedure um, of improvement as well so you know obviously models are only as good as the models and the data you put into it and the monitoring can help to um, improve those through an iterative approach so that's been done a lot in in Europe and North America that iteration to improve the atmospheric models and then you get a clearer picture of the sources of the PM 2.5 and, you know, where they are and what can be done about it. So the, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a very uh, nice uh, insight on the, the addressing this PM 2.5 pollutants. Uh, I also trying to look at it uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, although uh, the, the, the many, many times uh, uh, this was a key challenge, I think you might have also experienced, the number of monitoring locations, for example, a city area of 
uh, you know, more than uh, 100 sub square kilometer or 200 square kilometer. So we are trying to pick up a monitoring locations, maybe about five or six or 10, then try to do the source apportionment and try to look at it. But then uh, uh, the whole issue is uh, uh, the hair pollutants, uh, if it is an, uh, sometimes if it is a PM10 or 2.5, mostly it will be a localized sources and uh, the contributions from the uh, regional or the adjacent area will be uh, quite uh, uh, limited. So I, I, in that context, if there is a no industrial source or a long uh, uh, you know, transport of pollutants from one area to the other area, how do we use this uh, data in order to implement some policies? Well, I think PM 2.5 tends to be quite a regional pollutant. I mean, certainly it travels hundreds of kilometers. So mm -hmm. once you, you got the very small particles, they can be blown about in the winds and cover a very wide area. So I think that when you're talking about PM 2.5, um, you know, you will get a regional component as well as a local component to that. PM 10 obviously is more localized, but the health impact of PM 10 is, I mean, the smaller the particle, the bigger the health impact. You know, so some people say we should be monitoring PM1 um, because those are the ones that really get into your lungs, into the alveoli, into your bloodstream and have impacts throughout your body. So both PM10 and PM2.5 are kind of like um, proxies for the health damaging air pollutants. And PM10 really is a proxy for PM2.5 and PM2.5 is a better indicator of health impacts than PM10. So if we think about PM 2.5, because we're worried mainly about health impacts rather than nuisance, then um, you will have a regional and a local component. When you've got the monitoring um, and you can look into that to say, well, how much of this comes from biomass? How much of it comes from industrial sources? How much from diesel or whatever? Then that's very useful. But I do feel that having an atmospheric transfer model with an emission inventory would then allow you to target more effectively the sources of those pollution. So I do think that, you know, it's a question of not just relying on the monitoring, not just relying on the models, but putting it all together in an integrated way. And then you can more effectively identify which sources need to be reduced and where. Yeah, thank you for the uh... A wonderful ideas to I think it's we emphasize the integration of both monitoring and emission inventory and the modeling aspect in order to identify the management uh, issues. Yeah. Uh, I think I, the leap you have uh, very nicely uh, uh, you know indicated its applications in several uh, Asian countries. Uh, so yeah. do you have any applications in India about the leap software? Well, um, Leap has been, a, I mean, anybody can use Leap. You can go on the website, you can download it <clears throat> for um, low and low middle income countries. I'm not sure which is India is. I think in the World Bank classification, it's free. Um, for upper middle income and high income countries, they pay a contribution to the further development of the tool with a license. Uh, but you can get a license. I think for India, it's probably free. Um, uh, especially for uh, educational institutions. So there are probably hundreds of users of LEAP in India. So yes, there will be LEAP applications in India, but not, not by us. <laughs> so, um, you know, it is something that I think would be interesting. And I've discussed it with Mr. Kamyotra, who used to be in the Central Pollution Control Board, because what he said was that, you know, despite there being a lot of people doing emission inventories all over India, there isn't one system which kind of works at say states level and integrates up to a national level so there seems to be a gap still in 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 a system which can do that um so um yeah i mean certainly leap has been applied in india i mean when we were doing the work in bangladesh with uh, the Department of Environment, we were working with a Professor Tanvir from the Bangladesh University of Envi Environment and Technology. Now, um, when we were doing this, we found out from DOE that somebody else, a consultant called Mr. Bhattacharji, was also using LEAP to develop independently, totally independently, develop the climate change strategy for Bangladesh. So we linked up with him. So that's typical of what you would find is that People are using LEAP all over the world and uh, using it for greenhouse gas. 
a lot of the air pollution work is probably related to the work we're doing because it's not as broadly applied um, or not it leaf is very well known in energy and climate communities but certainly it would be interesting to apply it in india So I can see some of the chat uh, questions in the chat. Um, so dear, you mentioned that water vapor is a greenhouse gas, it is. Um, and in the global models, it's very much in there. And that's where a lot of the debate around the climate impact of black carbon, organic carbon has focused because it's all about cloud formation. Right. Um, so, you know, but those global models include the feedback of water vapor and so forth it's just that the water vapor is a is a, a consequence of the anthropogenic emissions and it's not anthropogenic water emission which is the problem so therefore it's kind of in there in the models but it's not really talked about as much apart from cloud formation which is the biggest and um, one of the biggest uncertainties um out there yeah thank you yeah and if you don't mind i would like to add a couple of points about the leap so that yeah, the general sure. public knows. So uh, about the leap, so it, it it is very well built, and then it's a most comprehensive, one of the most comprehensive models that exists right now, and it can do a lot of cause effect situations separately. So you can easily choose your variables, and then uh, what are the factors that's affecting, which are already pre-existing, or you can even upload your own files to it. And if anyone is interested in learning leap. Like, like Dr. Johan said, there are uh, a lot of videos, especially by Dr. Chris Malley from SEI York. Uh, you can find these videos from Dr. Chris Malley in YouTube. And also one more point about this NDCs that uh, we at SEI have been developing. So for Nigeria, we have done the uh, first, for the first time in the entire world, we have done it. We have included the health effects in the local areas in the NDC. So that has been the first time which was ever done in the NDC history. So that's one of the best things we have done. That's all from you, Thank you, Sudhir, oh. for, for additional inputs. Uh, who and some other questions? Can you um, I can look at the chat. So sure. uh, there's a question about industrial nickel and lead concentrations. Um, I haven't been dealing with the heavy metal um, uh, emissions so much, so I don't think I can help you. But the emission methods are well described in the um, MEPEA manual. Um, this is a an emission inventory manual that's um, predominantly used in Europe, but we use it as the basis for the leap calculations as well. So. In there, there are emission factors for um, all the heavy metals. Uh, we just haven't put it in LEAP yet, but that could be something we could do. Um, and certainly there is the, oh, there is an organization which is focusing very much on lead at the moment. Um, and it'll come to me, um, but, um, there is a clean air organization which is trying to promote any reduction of any sources of lead because of the horrible impacts it has on people and children. Um, Delhi chlorine levels are very high. Uh, burning plastic waste, I don't know, but certainly any burning of waste will release um, various nasty um, chlorine related um, emissions. Um, I think that, again, you'll find sort of dioxin and furan emissions in the MFEA manual. So um, that will tell you about different types of burning and different emissions coming from it. Um, and then uh, health estimates are generally the outcome of synergistic effects, different types of indoor and ambient air pollution as, well as, as lifestyle. Is it possible to desegregate and wait? Yes, it is. We did a there is a paper, and maybe Sudhir can send it round, 
um, which Chris Malley led, where we, because essentially one person will, you know, get up, they'll be in the house, they'll travel to work, they'll be in the workplace or school, um, then they will travel home, they may go out in the evening. So the concentration, the total exposure of that person to each compartment will depend on how long he spends or she spends in that compartment and what the concentrations are. So we try to look at um, an overall model of exposure for people in Accra in Ghana, um, depending on their lifestyle, depending on their age, depending on their occupation. So we looked at, you know, people cooking with biomass versus keep people cooking without biomass. Often it's women who are doing the cooking, so their exposure was greater in those uh, households cooking with biomass. Then you had the exposure on the way to work, and then you had different exposure indoors when you're either in a school or in a workplace. And then if your workplace was, you know, uh, for example, cooking food, then you would have additional exposure there for a longer period. So we try to look at that exposure of different people, um, the integrated exposure. Um, we didn't go as far as estimating the health impacts because the health impact assessments have been done based on either indoor or outdoor. And I'm not sure how easy it is to take what's been done and apply it to look at the health outcomes from an integrated exposure ranking. But um, yes, we did uh, um, some work and we also looked at an indoor air pollution model where we actually calculated the indoor concentrations depending on whether the windows are open or closed. So that's that's in a, a paper by Chris Malley. So um, if you have a look at that, that might answer some of your questions. Um, in terms of the synergistic impacts of different types of pollutant, that's more difficult. So most of the concentration response functions relate to single pollutants. And there is a debate of how much of the air pollution impact, health impact, is related, for example, to PM2.5 and how much to nitrogen dioxide. Um, and in the UK, they've put forward evidence that, you know, actually part of the PM2.5 really is nitrogen dioxide uh, related. But um, what we tend to do is follow the global burn of disease um, estimates and ways of estimating health impacts and the, the World Health Organization as well. It's very difficult to, to look at different combinations and, and estimate health. Um, right, secondary inorganic and organic aerosols. So um, in Europe now, because many of the um, primary sources of particles have been dealt with, there is a predominance of inorganic aerosols. Um, in tropical countries um, with high biomass emissions, there is a lot of organic aerosol. Um, so it really does vary um, depending on the climate and the sources of pollution as to how much is inorganic and how much organic. So um, there have been um, some attempts to, to look into this. Organic aerosols, I think, tend to be higher in tropical regions. Um, inorganic, where there are more industrialized regions, uh, especially the ones that have dealt with some of the sources of, of um, uh, primary particles. Um, one of the big issues at the moment is a discussion on what is the relative toxicity of different aerosols. And um, at the moment, um, the WHO doesn't separate out any of the different impacts. They consider PM2.5 impacts on people as the main indicator. There is a, a lot of discussion about black carbon, whether that should be separated out because there is indication it has a bigger impact on health compared to um, uh, the inorganic aerosols. Um, but most of the evidence at the moment points to PM2.5, whether it's inorganic um, or organic or, or related to particles. But um, uh, so that's what we use anyway. Uh, I think that uh, uh, well, thank you very much. I think it's uh, uh, good. 
I have one uh, comment from you because uh, since based on your vast experience, I just thought again, I just wanted to know, how do we look at uh, be, uh, the trade-off between uh, the, the uh, climate change aspect and the improving the air quality and the economics? Uh, and, for example, and then also the health benefits. So the, all these four components, how do we look at it? How do we trade off? Because a country like, uh, you know, some of the uh, economically, uh, you know, uh, 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 require a lot of uh, uh, strengthening the activities, then they may uh, need some critical evaluation in doing this trade off. The developed countries may be much easier. So what, what do you think, like, since you have involved in many countries? Well, I think part, one of the solutions to that is to have an integrated emission inventory. So, you know, like the one that's in LEAP, um, you know, where when you look at the sectors and the sources, you can look at both the greenhouse gas emissions, other emissions causing warming or cooling, um, and all of the air pollutant emissions and put it together. Then you can look at the different ways of solving the problem. So. Um, for example, a lot of the improvement in um, air pollution in Europe and North America has occurred from end of pipe solutions, but that doesn't address climate change. In fact, it makes it worse in many cases. So if you put a catalytic converter on a diesel car, then you need some energy to run the catalytic converter. And so therefore you get worse fuel economy, not much, but a little bit. If you have flue gas desulfurization on a coal-fired power station, you actually have to use energy to run the flue gas desulfurization unit, and you end up with more CO2 being emitted to solve the sulfur pollution problem. So, um, you know, those end of pipe solutions tend to address one pollution, uh, one problem, but not address the other. So, if we then move to solutions like renewable energy, rather, and shift away from coal then you end up with both an air quality and a climate benefit. If you move away from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles, public transport, walking and cycling, you deal with both problems together. So the way I think to um, look at these trade-offs and um, look at the synergies that can occur with different measures is to have an integrated emission inventory where you can say what will be the consequence of implementing different policies and measures and identify those which try and address both problems at the same time and then that will save you money as well maybe my last uh, you know question to uh, to you is uh, is there any lessons learned uh, uh, that can be useful for uh, indian air quality management <laughs> well there are so many aspects to this. There is political will. So, um, to my mind, I mean, from a sort of scientist perspective, we need to give the policy makers, or at least the ones that want to make change, all of the ammunition we possibly can to help them to do the right thing. And that's why we're now, we've been doing these different types of assessments, why we've been building um, capacity for people to do their own assessment and why we're addressing the cost of inaction because we feel that because people are so fixated on money and um, the cost of things we need to say to people there is a cost to doing nothing you know um, and that you need to act to reduce these costs of air pollution and of climate change so um, so one answer is to provide as much quantitative evidence as possible in the clearest possible way to motivate change and to um, engage people and different groups and persuade the policymakers that they need to take action. Then I think the capacity of the governments, government bodies, state governments, national government needs to be enhanced so that they have a clear idea of what needs to be done, what the consequence of that, and to have a proper planning process. Um, and then, of course, once we have good plans, they need to be implemented, and that's often a, a, a rate-limiting step. And for that, we need to look at various ways of um, combining climate change and air pollution together because money is going towards climate change. So we need to sort of 
use that as an opportunity to reduce air pollution. Um, but we need to look at innovative financing mechanisms to how this is going to be implemented. Um, so those are sort of three things, you know, good planning, political, uh, developing the political will, and then making sure that the resources are available to implement the um, responses needed to reduce both problems. Oh, and thank you very much. I think it was a wonderful insight and a very beneficial to many young researchers and also the policymakers. Thank you very much. So on behalf of uh, you know, Air Quality Management Association, IIT Madras, we thank you for your uh, wonderful lecture and time for spending uh, for uh, delivering this lecture. Thank you very much. I look forward to associate with you. And uh, I will discuss with Sudhir. Uh, we will see that how do we uh, take forward uh, with the uh, LEAP software applications and uh, can start that as a uh, first step towards our collaboration. That would be great. Well, thank you very much indeed, and, and I hope it was useful to you. Thank you, and uh, thank you all uh, for joining the uh, this uh, lecture, and uh, thank you very much. See you in the next lecture. Bye now. Bye.